Thrilled with the opportunity of being with you again around the Word of God. We're saturating in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, we've been looking, of course, at the genealogy. Uh, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 as it begins the uh, first narrative. And then we have been, uh, in the last class session, of course, we stood back and we tried to get an overall view of exactly what was taking place in the uh, whole realm and spectrum of the uh, four narratives. We saw that there was prophecy. We saw that there was uh, promoting. We saw that there was protection uh, all taking place in these narratives. That God is actively involved in fulfilling a divine plan and that we are to be in the middle of that plan and that He has an overwhelming plan for our lives. And I can't tell you how much that excites me. Uh, we want to go back to the first narrative. We uh, are going to spend some time in this narrative trying to get a uh, handle on exactly what is taking place and how this fits into uh, who Jesus is and what He is actually all about. So we're looking at Christology through the eyes of Joseph as Matthew portrays it. Uh, we want to look at uh, Matthew chapter 1 uh, beginning at verse 18 and we're going to go down through verse 25 <coughs> which again is the first narrative. Now he begins the first narrative with this great conjunction uh, but as he does all the narratives and it's highlighted for you and he moves into this uh, powerful, powerful uh, verse 18. And that literally sets the stage for all the narratives, but especially for uh, this first narrative, the story that's going to be told. Now we're going to again see everything through the eyes of Joseph because uh, this is his perspective as Matthew writes it. If you want Mary's perspective, you need to go to the Gospel according to Luke. There you will see how Mary felt about all of this and what was going on inside of her as she was uh, experiencing the great birth of Christ uh, through her life. But now we're looking into Joseph's viewpoint and the moral dilemma that he found himself in as he was struggling in the midst of all that was taking place. And this all unfolds. Now the first narrative, of course, takes us in time uh, span from the actual conception of the person of Jesus Christ uh, down through and including his birth in verse 25. And Matthew uh, tells us that Joseph, of course, obeyed the Lord and literally named him, gave him the name that the angel had instructed him to give, which was the name Jesus. So all was fulfilled. So you're actually going through uh, from uh, the conception of Christ down through his birth in this first narrative. And of course the emphasis is strong and pure and clear and it's the emphasis that Jesus Christ is born of God. As he says in verse 18, you'll remember, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then you'll note again that the angel in verse 20 uh, in his instructions to Joseph clarifies this one more time. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So all the way through we are getting the fact that God is involved. In fact in the prophecy we see it somewhat again that uh, Jesus will be born of a virgin. Uh, Behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. Virgin is with child. Hey, something's going on that's unusual and cannot be explained in terms of the physical aspect. And we're seeing that it will, he will be Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. So this is a strong emphasis that's given to us uh, in this particular narrative. There's one thing that's really interesting, and uh, I don't know how you're going to react to it, I have mixed feelings about it myself as I have struggled with trying to put all this together and to see exactly what God wants to say to me and in me uh, about himself as he's revealing himself to me. Uh, as I look at the narrative, of course, there is this moral dilemma that's taking place. And it presents quite an uh, issue, actually, in my own mind. Maybe you've never thought about it but it presents quite an issue in my mind. And I want to try to present that issue uh, to you as we enter into this discussion together. Uh, to kind of get us started in that, I want you to go to verse 18 again. And the sentence construction of verse 18 is really phenomenal. In fact, it kind of sets the stage for what's going to go on in the rest of the narrative as it paints an amazing picture. Now you know that the Greek language has a depth to it. 
And uh, the Greek language, of course, uh, is a picturesque language. So it's constantly painting these pictures for us so that we can see what is exactly taking place. Now that, of course, is taking place in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And it's a hallmark verse, as you remember. And we spent lots of time in it, saturating in it, trying to understand the proposition that Matthew is making through verse 18. Let's read it again. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Christ, Jesus Christ, was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now the interesting thing is that if you take this verse, this sentence, and you would lay it out in the Greek language, if you would see the Greek words as they are put in order, you would find that there is one Greek word at least in this sentence that's not translated. In fact, as best I could find out, as best I could research, I couldn't find one single translation that included this word in that translation. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I'm not saying that they did the wrong thing and left it out on purpose. Uh, I think that what has happened is that that Greek word, instead of translating it by itself, it was kind of absorbed into another word. And so it's just kind of uh, glossed over and bypassed in the English translation. And possibly there's no way to really properly translate the word into the English. So it again is absorbed into some other words. So it's kind of there, but it's not as distinct as it is in the Greek language. Now the word I'm talking about is really a very small word. In fact, it's only one letter. And it's equivalent to our letter A uh, or the word A. This is a word. The little word A is, uh, is included, of course. And it's a, it's a particle uh, which gives us real insight into what is taking place. And the way this little word A, this particle, is used is it, it sets up contrasting pictures, contrasting situations. It has the idea of, I'm, I want to give you uh, additional information. It has the idea of, I've given you this uh, picture, I've given you this information, I've, I've laid this circumstance out for you, but I want to give you a contrasting, over and above, additional, I want you to see something more, and this word introduces that. Now, it's not always just bypass, this word is not always just bypass in translation. We do translate it, and it is seen strongly in many, many scriptures. It, it marks something of a difference. Uh, it's translated or, often, or it's translated either, or sometimes it's translated than, and, and we see it uh, marking a difference, kind of like a check mark saying, hey, hey, this is, we're going from here, and I want to give you additional, additional information. For instance, if you would turn to uh, just a few pages to Matthew chapter 6, I'd like for you to look at verse 24, and of course this Greek word A is there uh, two times, and it's translated each time. Uh, and again, it's set up, you can see how the word is used in this chapter 6, verse 24, Sermon on the Mount, as you remember. And here's what he says in chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, here it comes, for either, there's the word A, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else, there's the other uh, time it's used, the word A, translated or else, he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, get the structure of the thing. No one can serve two masters, A, for either A, he will hate the one and love the other, or else A, he will be loyal to one and despise the other. So we set up, set up contrasting pictures with this. He will hate the one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. So he's giving us contrasting pictures and he introduces this with A, A. Interesting construction. Uh, turn the page again, go to Matthew chapter 12. And as you end up in chapter 12, uh, you'll see this same kind of construction given to us. Uh, it's actual, actually Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 33. Uh, again, you, you see this same kind of construction, and in verse 33, of course, it's translated, and it's used twice again. Either, 
chapter 12, verse 33, either, there's the word A, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else, A, or else, make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. So again, he sets up contrasting pictures. He's saying, hey, over on this side, uh, do this, make the tree good and its fruit good, or else you got to make the tree bad and its fruit bad. A, A, make the tree good or its, and its fruit good, or else, A, make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruits. In other words, you can't intermix them. Hey, if tree is good, it has good fruit, tree is bad, it has bad fruit, a good tree can't have bad fruit, so you can't have A, A, and he's contrasting the picture. Now, that gives you something of the idea of the use of the word. Now, that word A is used in verse 18. And again, it sets up two contrasting pictures. Now, where it shows up in verse 18 is uh, after the word before and uh, just and before the words they came together, which of course is one Greek word. So as you read the sentence in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before then the word A, they came together. Before they came together. Before is one Greek word. They came together is one Greek word. And right in the middle is this little word A, which again sets up two contrasting pictures for us. So there it gives you the idea that I want to give you additional information. Now what's happened of course in the translation is the word A which marks a difference is a particle marking a difference saying I'm going to introduce to you additional material. I want to give you two contrasting pictures. Is lit, that little word is literally absorbed into the word before. And it becomes a part of that which is probably right but it, it has the meaning here of I giving you additional information which changes something of your perspective of what exactly is going on. So the idea is that he's giving you two contrasting situations and he's presenting two different uh, uh, circumstances that you really need to struggle with and need to be resolved. A. Now, let's discuss that and try to get a handle on it as we look at uh, this great verse and see what it has to do with Jesus. Now, Mary, you understand, we know very little about her. And in order to get to what we want to discuss, I need to give you uh, what little information we do know and we need to saturate in Mary and Joseph and see what kind of situation they were really involved in. And then you'll begin to understand what Matthew was attempting to say here. Mary, again, we know uh, very little about her, have little information. Uh, her sister was Salome, who was the mother of uh, James and John, which you find out in Matthew chapter 27, verse 56. Of course, we know that Mary was of the lineage of King David as well, because we discover that in the genealogy that's given us in the gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 3. Um, Luke in that gospel traces the lineage of Jesus Christ through Mary. So can you see how inclusive the gospels are? Uh, I mean, Luke is covering the bases by, by, uh, by going through the lineage of uh, uh, Mary to find the lineage of King David in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So he is of the lineage of, of King David and has the right to sit on the throne through the line of Mary or through the line of Joseph. See, both of them come back to King David. So, hey, it's really well covered. So you get that, get that emphasis uh, in, this, in this scene. So Mary is of the lineage of King David as well. Now, she came from Nazareth, the little hometown, small town. Uh, the town of Nazareth was probably from a poor family, a struggling poor family. Uh, she had a cousin by the name of Elizabeth. You'll remember that because, uh, according to Luke again, when she heard the announcement in the garden, the angel told her, you're going to be with child. Uh, she immediately wanted to tell somebody, and she went down to her cousin Elizabeth, who, of course, was older, and at this point in her life was beyond the point of bearing children and had been barren all of her life, but found herself with child, the child of John the Baptist. 
So Mary was probably in her teens and uh, Elizabeth was again beyond the point of bearing children age-wise so she was uh, older, maybe even a senior adult because uh, her husband Zacharias was ready to retire from the priesthood. So you've got this cousin Elizabeth who's entering into the whole drama of the unfolding of what's going to take place. We know something of the spiritual condition of Mary, which is phenomenal. She is totally, absolutely submissive uh, to uh, God. Hey, her response all the way through this is, whatever you want, whatever you want. Uh, as the angel appears to her in the garden, she simply says, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, let it, be a meet, let it be to me according to your word. Hey, I'm not resisting. This is going to ruin my life, but I'm not resisting. You have a plan. I want to fit in. And she is totally, absolutely submissive to all that God is proposing in this situation. In fact, why don't you turn to Luke? It would be worth looking at for us. And in Luke chapter 1, you see some details to this whole submission as it unfolds. Uh, you need to go down uh, to uh, oh, verse 26. It's the sixth month. The angel Gabriel has uh, been sent by God uh, to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. And he's come in verse 27 to a virgin who's been betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, they are uh, in the garden probably. And in verse 28, note what's happening. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. Tells you something of her spiritual status. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw uh, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and, his, uh, and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Now go down to verse 45 because as, she, as Mary has gone down to Elizabeth's house in verse 41, uh, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. So here's what God is saying about Mary. Verse 44, For indeed as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ear, the babe leaped in my womb for joy and then said this, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. It was a prophecy. So Mary was a believer. She believed. For the word of the angel is, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of these things which were told her by the Lord. So that's about all we know of Mary. Uh, we're not giving her exact, given her exact age, but if it followed the scene of their particular cultural setting, she was in her teen period. Uh, Joseph, we, abs we know absolutely less about him than we do Mary. If we don't know much about Mary, we know very little about Joseph. We know, for instance, he, his father was Jacob, according to the genealogy in verse 16, Matthew chapter 1. We know that. We know that he was a carpenter, that he uh, was a craftsman, that he was uh, uh, an individual who worked with his hands, which means he probably was, again, of a lower class, a poorer side of the family, a construction worker. We know, according to verse 19, that he too was a righteous man. Uh, my translation says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. So he was a righteous, just man in the eyes of the law. Uh, we know that from logic we understand that he wasn't around all that much. That after Jesus was born and for some time there, something happened. Maybe he died, he, probably he died, and Mary was left on her own with the children and uh, we don't see Joseph, uh, we don't see him after the 12 years of age of Jesus Christ. That whole scene, he, he disappears and he's never talked about or heard of from that point on. Uh, they were, of course, in a betrothal period. Now, you have to understand what that meant because that is very significant to the whole moral dilemma and story. You see, it was customary 
that the girls would uh, actually enter into marriage very early in life. Uh, it was uh, usual for their culture that something like 12 years of age, 13 years of age, these girls would enter into a contractual betrothal marriage period. Now what that meant was that there were two stages to marriage. There was the first year of the marriage. Now this is the umbrella of marriage and underneath that umbrella there were two things happening. The first year which was the betrothal period. They were legally married. It was a part of the umbrella of marriage. So it wasn't like engagement and really was just exchange rings and we're going to get married. No, they are married. They have entered into the contract. This is the umbrella. And within that umbrella, there is this betrothal period, a one-year period. Uh, and then there would be the marriage ceremony where they would actually enter into uh, sexual relations and begin to live together as husband and wife. So for one year they're married with no marriage contact, no intimacy, no physical contact, at least very little even talking with each other. Then there's this uh, additional uh, event of the marriage ceremony and they enter into actual, actually living together. Now, all of this was normally arranged by the family. It was a contract. Uh, it was a contract that was sealed by a dowry. In other words, the bridegroom of the marriage situation and or his family, but normally the bridegroom, and some think that Joseph may have been in his 30s, so he was an older man, uh, and that was customary again in their culture. So uh, Joseph uh, brings a dowry to Mary's parents and a dowry is uh, given as a gift for the bride and the reason for that of course was that uh, if a divorce came out of this if uh, this man would take their daughter and would marry her and then divorce her she would end up back at the father's house, at her father's house. And so to compensate for any kind of misunderstanding or anything that would happen if, he, if the father would end up having to support her in future days, a dowry was given. So this dowry has been given. Joseph is given the dowry as the bridegroom. The contract has been entered into, signed by every party involved, and they are under the umbrella of marriage. They are officially called, in verse 19, husband and wife. Uh, in fact, the angel, you'll note, uh, down in verse uh, uh, 20, says, uh, Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. Hey, don't be afraid. Well, are they married? Yes, they're married, but they're not living together. They're in the betrothal period, that one-year period. That's the period that uh, is, is the scene of this, of this particular hour. So, the contract has been signed, the dowry has been given, and uh, they are now officially married, husband and wife, only they are not living together. They are in the one year a dowry. And the minute the contract is signed, it's legal and it's binding. And again, they are considered married. Uh, and uh, they have very little social contact. Now, a moral disaster has taken place. Joseph is absolutely shocked. Uh, three months have gone by from the time that Mary heard the announcement. And isn't it interesting, as you saturate and pick up some of these facts, isn't it interesting that Mary didn't tell Joseph? You would have thought that she would have told Joseph. I mean, an angel of the Lord shows up at her home and tells her, Mary, you're going to be with child, and the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you, and you are going to experience conception in your womb. And she immediately leaves and runs down to her cousin Elizabeth and stays three months down there and has no contact with Joseph and doesn't try to explain to him, doesn't try to defend herself, doesn't say, hey, it's not what you think, doesn't try to explain it. She is absolutely trusting God to do her explanation. Hey, you got me into this, God? This is your deal, not my deal. I'm not going to manipulate the scene. Hey, this is all on you, and if Joseph is going to line up and he's going to understand, you're going to have to be the one that going, that's going to tell him. So I'm leaving all the details, and, uh, and I'm leaving it all up to you. There's a powerful holiness truth to that. 
See how careful we are to defend, to, to justify, to explain, to straighten out, to manipulate, to, hey, we'd run right over there and say, hey, now wait a minute, this is what's happening, it's not my fault, I want you to, no, hey, I'm leaving this all up to you, God, this is your battle, you're going to have to handle it, and God, and indeed God is handling it, no question about that. So Mary has been down to Elizabeth's house for three months. Now she is giving physical evidence to the, the, to the conception and the announcement that the angel has made. So here she is. She's come back to Nazareth. Talk, 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 talk. You can hear the rumors all over town. Joseph no doubt hears the rumors. We're not told this, but Joseph uh, uh, probably heard the rumors. Hey, he, he said, I can't believe this. This can't be true. Must be a lie. So he sends somebody down to check it out. Sure enough, they come back, say, hey, it's absolutely true. No question out about it at all. Mary is with child. Now, Joseph knows he's not the father. Hey, he's not the father. So if he's not the father, what is the obvious conclusion? Well, there's only one conclusion you can come to. She's had an affair. In this legal binding umbrella of marriage, during this first year betrothal period, she has had an affair. Oh my, it's a moral disaster. Now the only way to get out of this uh, marriage is to have a divorce because they are legally husband and wife. Although they're not living together, they're in the one year time bracket. So he's decided I'm just going to give her a private divorcement. And he could have, by Jewish law, taken her down to the magistrates at the courts. They would have passed judgment and according to Jewish law, she would have been stoned to death and that would have ended her life. He didn't want to do that. He's a just man. He loved her. He's decided just to get away from this thing as far as he can. He'll just give her a private divorcement according to what he's decided in verse 19 to put her away secretly and just her life will be over. Her future life will be done. Let the chips fall where they may. He can't solve all the problems, but at least she won't be dead. Her reputation will be ruined. Nobody will ever want to marry her. Uh, the child that's going to be born will uh, be considered illegitimate and of course in God's eyes the plan of God will be aborted. Uh, there will be uh, no legitimacy for the birth of Jesus Christ. So there's the situation. Now you can see what's happening uh, back to verse 18 and the word A that he's saying I want to give you additional information. I, I want to tell you uh, something about what is happening. See, Matthew's already presented to us that Jesus Christ is born. So that information is already given, given to us, but I need to give you a contrasting picture. I need to show you a moral dilemma. I want to set two things up for you. And this is a vivid, vivid picture. On the one hand is the picture of a righteous man. His name is Joseph, as we've just described. He has plans and he has dreams. He wants a family. He loves Mary. He uh, is planning his job. Probably is, has a house all picked out. He, uh, he's a carpenter, so he's got a good future. He's uh, got a business going on. He's, he's, uh, he's a righteous man. A righteous man. Uh, according to the law of Israel, doing all the things that he should do. So this is a good catch for Mary. Hey, this is, a, this is a good deal. Hey, she's going to enter into Joseph's home and he will provide and be a proper husband and dreams of children and raising a family. This is, these are his dreams. On the other end is Mary. She's a wholesome young lady. She is obedient to God. She is righteous also in the eyes of the law. She is pure. She is a virgin. She is everything you could want in a wife to be. So Joseph, Joseph on the one hand, righteous, uh, uh, everything goes okay. Uh, Mary is righteous, pure, virgin. There's nothing but bright hopes. There's nothing but a good future. E everything is at it as it should be here. The parents have agreed to the dowry. The contract is made up. The marriage is set. There's nothing but bright hopes. There's nothing but joy and, f and happiness in the future. Everything is going to unfold in greatness. But, now here comes the other scene. But, or A, let me give you additional information. This is the way it appears. Bright hopes, good future, a wholesome marriage, wholesome young lady. This is wonderful. Oh, she's getting a good catch. My, he's lucky to have her. There's going to be children. It'll be a nice, wonderful. They'll have a good home. They'll have a good future. Here's that scene. But, 
a factor is injected and suddenly the whole thing is changed. It's a moral disaster. Mary is with child. How can this be? An affair has happened. Oh, how can it be? An adulterous, uh, an adulterous deal has taken place. Oh, how could this be? She was a child and Joseph is not the father. Oh my, she has been unfaithful. How could she do it? A wholesome, pure virgin has ended up allured into the bed of another man. Hey, somebody has caused an overwhelming dilemma. Somebody has taken a nice, wholesome young lady and spoiled her. The dreams are banished. The, the dreams are smashed. Hey, Joseph is in turmoil. All of his plans, the home, everything that he wanted to fear the future is wiped out. Hey, an overwhelming, hopeful, great story to come. Happiness has all of a sudden turned into despair. Faithfulness has turned into unfaithfulness. Suddenly hope and beauty has turned into ugliness and shame. What was a glorious scene has now become an absolute disaster. Who on earth is the one who's caused this? Where is the man who, uh, who beguiled uh, Mary into this? Where is the man that that, that seduced her, that brought her into this kind of situation? Where is the man that's dis devastated this kind of home and brought this kind of moral decline? Where is the individual that's done this? Of course, you know the, you know the answer. It's God. God is the one who's caused all this trouble. God is the one who's brought this about. God is the one who's pulled this off. God is the cause of this. Now, I don't know what you want to do with that, but in my mind, see, if another man had done this, put God out of the picture and put another man in this, a man has seduced Mary, and now she's with child, and this whole scene is created. If another man had done this, we'd have said, well, that no good, lousy, low down, why didn't, why he couldn't leave his hands off of that pure young girl? She was innocent and he seduced her. That Why, well, this is terrible. The home, homebreaker, uh, adulterer, why, well, the filth of the man, why, well, he's terrible. If another man had done this. But God did this. And when God did this, we said, oh, praise his name, glory to God, what a righteous God, holy God, oh, what a, he has a plan, he's pulling off a big deal, God is redeeming a world, we applaud him and say, yay, God, yay, God, man does it, oh, it's sin, it's disaster, oh, it's awful, God does this, we say, yay, God, it's holy, it's righteous, it's sacred, oh, we bow, we worship, we say glory to God. I think that's an interesting dilemma. Now, it seems to me that Matthew is trying to at least, in beginning stages, deal with that kind of issue. The answer to the whole dilemma, how can, um, if a man does it, it's sin. If God does it, it's holy. The, 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 coming to grips with the dilemma is, well, what gives God the right to do this? How can God do what man could do and it's okay. If a man did it, it's sin. If God uh, comes and allows this to happen in Mary's life, it's right and hopeful. If a man is, 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 is the reason for this, then it's sinful. If God is the reason for this, then it's holy. If, if man does this, then it's filled with unrighteousness and damnation. If God does the same thing, then it's proper and it's right and it's good and we applaud it. What, what gives right what, what, does God, what gives God the right to do this? What gives God the right to come into a wholesome, pure, young woman at that situation and mess it up and, and bring a moral disaster and ruin, ruin the plans of this young couple and, and literally bring a stigma uh, of unrighteousness upon the whole scene? What gives God the right to do that? that the, that's the issue I'm trying to address. What gives God the right to do this? Now, I want you again to turn uh, back to the Gospel according to Luke. And we've indicated this and probably said it, but we've never looked at the Scripture together. But uh, I, I want you to have this uh, clear uh, in your thought process. Uh, I want to be sure this is clear. Go to Luke chapter 1. Uh, it's found in the words that the uh, angel is speaking. 
Uh, he's in the garden, and we read some of that in verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. Uh, he's in the garden, he's appeared in the garden, uh, in Nazareth, uh, to Mary, and is giving her the news of exactly what's going to take place as she is going to be with child. And of course, her response is in verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, uh, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Hey, I'm in the betrothal period. I'm a virgin. I don't know a man. So how on earth? I've not had sexual relationships with a man. So how on earth can I, can I be with child? See, you come and you say, hey, you're going to be with child. And I, hey, I'm open. I'm accepting. I'm saying, hey, you are the voice of God and, and I want what God wants. But would you give me some insight in how this could be pulled off? Uh, and in verse 35, that insight is given to us. Look at it. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come up on you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now what I'm interested in you seeing again is that there's absolutely no indication of sexual involvement between God and Mary. You've got to get clear out of the physical realm here. If you want that, there are other world religions that you can get involved in who have that kind of thing. Uh, sexual relationships between their God and a woman. But that's not what's going on in here. This is not any kind, there's no indication of any kind of sexual involvement at all. The idea is, Holy Spirit will come upon you. Hey, the power of the highest will overshadow. So you got the ideas upon you and overshadow you. In fact, you'll remember that when the, when the promise of the Holy Spirit was fulfilled, uh, Jesus told about what was going to happen in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Same kind of idea. The overshadowing idea. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. That He is creative in His presence. And there's no sexual activity going on here. Hey, this, this is conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit's presence. Life is imparted through the very overshadowing. It's the kind of brooding, you'll remember, that took place over the earth that was void and deep and the Holy Spirit brooded in a creative way and creation came out of the brooding of the Holy Spirit upon. So there's no indication of sexual activity. But still, what gave God the right to mess up their lives? It's like nobody questioned it. Nobody says, oh my God, what gave you the right to do this? Everybody just kind of understood God had a right to do this if he wanted to. Of course, you could say God is sovereign and he has a right to do what he wants to do. And that solves that. But see, God doesn't have a right to break his own rules. And adultery, hey, that kind of a thing, man, all the way through is, is, is spoken against by God himself. So God isn't going to break his own rules. So what's going on here? What gives, the right, what gives God the right to pull this off? And of course, the answer is in the context of the Old Testament. And this is a beautiful concept. And I want you to get this in your thinking because this has something to do with the Christology of Jesus Christ and who He is in our lives. If you go to the Old Testament, you will see that over and over and over and over and over and over, can't tell you how many times, over again in the Old Testament, we are called, Israel is called the bride of God. God is the bridegroom, Israel is the bride. In fact, uh, I challenge you to go to a concordance and look up the word harlot and find out all the, all the places in the Old Testament that the word harlot is mentioned. And it is overwhelming. It, is, it, it seems to appear everywhere. I mean, it just shows up time and again. In fact, I want you to turn to some of them. Turn to uh, Ezekiel. It's a little hard to find. It's after Psalms, uh, Psalms and Proverbs. And you got Jeremiah. And you, then you got Ezekiel. You got Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. But when you come to Ezekiel, I want you to go to uh, chapter 16. And there's just some powerful statements here. And this is uh, all about this concept. And now in chapter 16, uh, go down to verse uh, 30, and we'll read just a few verses. But when you get down to uh, verse uh, 30, 
you see some interesting uh, scene. And the Lord God is speaking here. And the Lord God is, is broken hearted. He, he's all torn up. And, and what is it that's torn God up? What is it that's devastated Him? Why is He so all upset? Well, look, look at verse 30. How degenerated is your heart. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God. Seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. Now he's talking to Israel. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God. Seeing you do all of these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. You erect your shrine at the head of every road, and you build your high place in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot, because you scorned a payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payments to all the harlots, but you make your payment to all of your lo lovers, and you hire them to come to you from all around for your uh, harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry, because no one solicits you to be a harlot, in that you gave payment, but no payment was given to you. Therefore, you are the opposite. Now then, O harlot, hear the words of the Lord. <laughs> Do you, uh, whoa, what a, what a passage. Do you see what God is saying? Israel, you're a harlot. But he says, man, you're worse than a harlot. You're, you're absolutely worse than a harlot. You, you're an unfaithful, adulterous wife. Hey, harlots, at least they're paid for it. But man, you pay others to come to you and have relationship with you. You pay strangers to come in instead of your husband. You're worse than, you're worse than a harlot. So harlot, line up and hear the words of the Lord. See, this is a, a broken-hearted God who's saying, Oh, Israel, you're my wife. Oh, Israel, you're my lover. Oh, Israel, you're my bride. Oh, Israel, I want to be one with you. Oh, Israel, you have betrayed me. Oh, Israel, you, you have been an adulterous wife. Oh, Israel, you have played the role of the harlot. Oh, Israel, my wife, my wife. Oh, Israel. See the emphasis? God considered Israel to be his wife. Now again, this is all the way through. And he's broken hearted, absolutely broken hearted of, over the unfaithfulness. Uh, now Hosea, of course, is a, is a powerful story. Uh, and you know the story of Hosea. And I'd like for you to turn to uh, that story if you would. Because again, the whole story illustrates this this Old Testament concept that is so prominent in, in all the way through that Israel is called the wife of God and it's, it's in terms of that relationship that we're dealing with. Now Hosea, you know of course what happened to Hosea. Hosea was told by God, Hosea was a prophet, and he was told by God to go down and marry a prostitute. So he went down and found this prostitute by, uh, by the name of Gomer, Gomer and uh, uh, married her, fell in love with her, and married her, and brought her into his house. And, of course, she was faithful for some time, and they had several children. But then, A, her old ways took over, and she left and went back. Back into harlotry, back into prostitution. And she sold herself, and, of course, Hosea's brokenhearted and all upset and wondering what God, what are you doing here, God? You told me to do this, and now what a disaster, and now I got these boys, and, and it's just an awful thing, God, and my heart is broken. And, 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 and God sends him down again, and he comes down to the marketplace, and there she is on the auction block. Her body is, is, is wrecked, her health is gone, her, her beauty is dissipated, and she's being sold cheap on the auction block uh, as a slave, uh, worthless. There she is. And Hosea, broken hearted, absolutely broken hearted, buys her back, brings her back into his home, nurses her back to hell, loves her all over again, all according to the instructions of God. And then when it's all over, God turns to him and says, Hey, I want to tell you, you know how you felt? You, this has been terrible for you, I know, Hosea. You, you've struggled through this whole thing. You've been broken hearted. This has been an awful experience for you. But I did all of this that you might have some kind of inclination about how I feel. Hosea, the same identical way you felt. 
about your wife going back into prostitution and, and about her unfaithfulness and, and seeing her with other lovers and, and her brokenness and how it's ruining her life and how it's destroying her and, and how you loved her so much you wanted to buy her back. All that you felt in those days, Hosea, that's exactly the way I feel. That's exactly the way I feel about Israel. My wife. Oh, and about her, about her prostitution and about how she's not been faithful to me and how she's had other gods and how she won't remain loyal to me. And, and my wife, the way you felt, that's the way I feel. And the way you wanted to buy her back is the same identical way, Hosea. I want to buy her back. Look at the instructions of God. Hosea chapter 3. It's, it's a powerful thing. Hosea chapter 3, look at verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Hosea said, Go again. Go again. Hey, all of this has taken place, but go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and have loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. He said, Hey, the Lord said to him, Go, go again. Love that woman, and she's been unfaithful, and love her back, man, and get her again, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, for look who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. See, this is a powerful image, isn't it? And and and, and it's all the way through that that we are we are the, the wife of God, we're the bride of of, of the Christ Himself. What a, what a ph phenomenal concept. Now that's Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, it's a little more positive. And I, wanna, I want you to look at some of those scriptures as we move into the New Testament. It's a little more positive. For instance, I want you to turn to Ephesians and uh, look at this great passage. It's a, Ephesians gives us some real insight into the home. And in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, oh, go down to... Uh, Go down to verse uh, 25 and we'll read, just read a couple verses. Here's what the New Testament has to say. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that, she, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any other any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish, presented as his wife. Wow. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And the symbolism there is that Christ died for his wife. Christ is, is redeeming his wife. Christ is presenting a glorious, glorious bride uh, for the marriage. Wow. Uh, look at Paul. He, he does something of the same thing, not only in Ephesians, but in 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And again, this same concept begins to show up, that we are considered the bride of Christ. So this is not some isolated little deal. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. L look at verse 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, Paul says. And indeed, you do bear with me, for I am jealous of you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul says, hey, bear with me. I I I'm a little foolish. And the reason I'm talking a little foolish is because I have this overwhelming thing in my life. I, I, I have a love for you that I might present you betrothed to Jesus. I betrothed you to Him. You're in the one year marriage period. Uh, uh, I'm betrothed you to this husband uh, uh, that you might be presented to Him as a chaste, clean, pure bride. Oh, let me give you one other. It's in Revelation chapter 2 or chapter 21. You can find that easily. Revelation chapter 21. And this is so powerful because it gives us the climax of the whole thing. Married supper of the Lamb kind of thing. Chapter 21 verse, verse 9. Here's what it says. It says, then one of the seven angels which had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's what we are. We're the bride, the lamb's wife. 
So I'm, I'm looking at this whole dilemma, this moral dilemma. What gives God the right to come and mess up this young couple's life? Oh, we are the bride, man. We are the bride. And Jesus is the bridegroom. And that whole picture flows into this. The commitments that come out of that. Now I want you to contemplate the idea of marriage and the total absolute, absolute commitment that is to be in marriage. I want you to contemplate the idea of the surrender your, uh, of yourself See, all of that is now in this relationship with Christ. Christ is our bridegroom. We are His bride. And the kinds of commitment that go on in marriage, hey, lasting, uh, overwhelming, the binding relationship of this, that's what this is all about. Christ is seen in His Christology as our bridegroom. Hey, saturate on it. See yourself as the bride of Christ.